You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, and author of a new book called Auction Ready, How to Buy Property at Auction Even Though You're Scared Shitless. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, and together we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Bootcamp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. Today we're going to discuss some newly released granular data on Australian property investors. It's a snapshot into the decisions that individual investors have been making and they are, quite frankly, a little alarming. The author of this work describes it as nuanced, measurable information on real-life property investors and their holdings across both location and sector. The report is relevant and in-depth in a way that big data sometimes struggles to be. Are you curious? Well, we certainly are. So we've asked the author, Mike Mortlock, to join us to discuss his research. Mike is a managing director of MCG Quantity Surveyors, and he has completed thousands of residential and commercial schedules from units to hotels to trout farms. Through his work with clients over the years, he's been given unique access into the behaviour and outcomes of a thousand property investors. You may remember Mike from episode 60, where he revealed his personal moral dilemma of having a business model that benefits from property investors being sucked in by spruikers. Thanks for coming along <laughs> and bearing your soul again, Mike. Thank you for having me. And gosh, what an intro. It's always good to write your own review, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Good to chat, Mike. Um, we've been reading your uh, 1,000 assets study. Mm. Can you tell us, um, our listeners, a little bit about what you've done um, and how you've come to put it together just to kind of because a few interesting insights that are on the back of that you found out. Yeah, well, I'm a data nerd, as you guys well know, and anyone that's probably heard me speak before. Um, and the, 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 when we started the business, what we wanted to do is we wanted to share data that had never been seen within our industry before. And we, we collect answers to questions that other places don't just by virtue of the work that we do. So the first real data release we did was we we grabbed a thousand residential assets and we were the first depreciation company to say, well, the average deductions for an investor aren't between five and ten thousand dollars. They're nine thousand one hundred and eighty three dollars exactly, right? And I gave a couple of decimal points just to show that I was really paying attention. Now we've got four lots of a thousand residential depreciation schedules from residential property investors. And that has given us the ability to see the trends and and have a look at what investors are purchasing and any changes in behaviour over time. So you're looking at your clients. Is there any sort of particular skew you think that um, might make it not that representative of the whole of Australia? Absolutely. And that's a great question. The data is only as good as the people that think we're pretty cool and they should work with us, right? And by virtue of the locations that we are more active in. So for example, when we break it down into some of our state by state analysis, we we purposely leave a couple of states out because our data wasn't such that we thought it was telling an accurate enough story. So I've, I've certainly always been concerned about, look, is this representative enough? Like yes, it's a thousand. It's a thousand people at a minimum, and that's kind of like the the statistical minimum of what is enough to be able to mm. tell a, a representative story. But when we had a look at the percentage of investors buying uh, established properties versus new as part of the negative negative gearing debate, so you might remember Mr. Bowen was saying that um, there was mm. a ninety six percent failure rate, so people were buying established. We yes. we actually um, found that figure to be forty six percent, and that. Matched 
matched the data that came from the mortgage aggregators AFG and their data would be massive compared to ours. So we thought actually yep. like they've got a proper sample compared to us and our yep. figures were almost identical. So that gave me a little bit more confidence and I, and I, and I certainly take your point but I think that based on that we, we're of the view that yes, th- this is valuable data. I remember that um, because, you know, there was, <laughs> we, we won't go and revisit the whole <laughs> negative gearing argument, but certainly I was incensed at the time at the misuse of data. Um, and that was a very, very good example. And I know when that hit the press, it was like, wow. So does this put into doubt everything else that, you know, Labor had been claiming at the time? And there were lots of other anomalies as well. But um, what are some of the things that you are finding out or you have been finding out through this, this exercise that is not or has not been captured in the big data? Yeah, so one one question that we ask that you I, I can't I can't see where it would it would be available elsewhere is the percentage of people that live in their investment property prior to renting it out. So mm. if you think about when you when we're engaged to do a depreciation schedule, someone has to buy or build a property and it'll either be an investment property from day one or they'll live in it and then they will engage us. So we have a pretty good idea of whether they've lived in the property or not because then, of course, they need to engage us and we can see the time between when they bought it and when they actually made it available to produce income because you can't claim deductions until the property is available to produce income, i.e. a rental. So we have to ask that question. I don't know any other industry that asks that question. So Mm. we actually found that 25.7% of landlords live in their investment property before they move out. And that was a bit of a surprise. If I had to guess, I might have said 10%. And then yep. there's the other side of it as well, right? People would say, oh, well, that's just, you know, people trying to get the first homeowner grant and you've got to live in it for six or 12 months. But we actually find that the average amount of time that people were spending living in the property was over four years. So there's mm. there's, there's something else at play there. That's really so what you're saying is, you know, I mean, the interesting part of that is that 25% of property investors a big chunk of them would be just accidental investors. They didn't actually buy that property as an investment. They potentially bought it as a home and then some point down the line they decided to upgrade or move to another property and keep that property as an investment, you know, instead of selling it. That's kind of what that's alluding to, do you agree? Yeah. In in fact, that was a that was an article that we had um in in the courier mail that went through to news.com it was the rise of the accidental investors now they're not all going mm. to be accidental sometimes this would yep. be a strategic thing but i think given by virtue of the fact that the average amount of days that people have have lived in the property let's say in our last data sample which was 1537 see i told you i was a data nerd <laughs> um, that that's telling the story that there are people that must say get a broker and say i want to upgrade my property and the broker says you know you probably don't have to sell this and you could keep it as an investment property that that would be an example of where i would see an accidental investor being created yeah, definitely. And also, I mean, if people get a transfer and they move into state or overseas, uh, there could be a real reason to think, well, I'm going to return and I will keep that property for mm. a period of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is interesting that the accidental investor concept. And I wonder how, because in a way, you know, we, I guess one of our arguments when we're in, behind this podcast is we want people to be more conscious about the things that they're doing around property in particular. Um mm. And, you know, there are people buying property for all sorts of reasons and all sorts of motivations and all sorts of beliefs uh, that aren't necessarily um, aligned with the outcome they're going to get. And I guess that whole idea of accidental investment is in tune with that, right? Mm. Do do you break down any of the reasons why they've actually become investors? We, we, we did speak to a couple of investors as part of the, the article that we prepared. So it was a little bit of a media release, but, but not really. Like a lot of the time it's data that we collect. We don't really maintain a great relationship with the clients. That sounds like I'm running a terrible business, but it's, it's actually a pretty quick process to get a depreciation yeah. schedule done. And often we're engaged via email or 
phone. We, we do mm. the work and they go off into the big bad world. So it's not like going to see yeah. your accountant each year. So yeah. we, we don't have a, a huge amount of background to it. One thing that we crunched a little bit harder. So say, for example, in, in our five years of data for all the purchased properties rather than, say, built by the client, the average reno value was just over $29,000. Now, where someone had not lived in the property, it was $23,000. And where they had mm. lived in the property, it was $39,914.84. So that's telling me that people are spending yep. more money on their property when they're occupying, which must give, it gives me the idea that they intended to stay there longer. They're spending more money on yep. it than someone that is purely having a tenant in mind. Mm. So we, we get this situation quite a lot where clients will come in and they'll have a property and they're thinking about upgrading or purchasing another property and they have this belief that you should never sell and you should always hold on. Um, and, you know, you look at the assets and the debt and you think actually from a tax point of view, from a structuring and a kind of debt point of view, it actually makes sense. Even though it's, if it's a poor property, it's generally going to be a great idea to sell it anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just about timing the sale. But if it's a quality asset, you, you know, you really want to try to keep it. But a lot of the time, because that property has grown in value and they've also didn't think they were going to ever move out of it, so they paid it off. Um, from a tax and a loan point of view, it generally makes sense to actually sell, buy the new home, and then go buy another investment property so you can have a much bigger tax deductible debt. So what this is kind of saying is that people are kind of kind of ignoring that or potentially their properties haven't grown um, and they're just kind of just, I guess, trying to hold on to it because of the belief that you should never sell rather than potentially something that's a, you know, a better strategy. Yeah, well, I think Veronica made a pretty adroit point about the accidental investor and, and investors really probably shouldn't be doing anything by accident, right? There should be a strategy. Mm. They should be getting advice from experts such as you guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It might not necessarily be the right decision, but by just by virtue of the fact that we have found at least a, a reasonable mm. chunk of people that are doing something by accident, then that sort of has wider implications for investment decisions, you know, a, across the whole um, property sphere. While we're there, though, have you seen that there's a huge, uh, like, um, location bias? So, you know, a lot of your property investors, let's say you're in Newcastle, so, you know, their investors have got their properties in Newcastle, their investment properties. Have you, have you got any data on that or have you seen that? Um, consistently over the years in your job? No, like so. You're you're asking the question. The I guess the the gap between where the people live and where they invest. Yep, that's a that's a great question. We're actually building that data. Uh, we we don't have as accurate data on the actual location of the investors themselves, like their postal details. It's not as robust. Okay. Um, yep. That is in the works, but anecdotally, we do find that your average investor is investing pretty close to where they live. Um, you can sort of see that anecdotally when we when we know where, they, where they're actually located themselves and where their investment property is. That's something that I think is slowly changing over mm. time and it'll be interesting to see the, the trend in the, in the data as that comes through our system. But certainly people want to invest in areas that they are familiar with themselves, especially if they're not using an advisor. So let's just sort of go back a, a minute to, I guess, so our listeners can understand the process that uh, a client might come to you and then you would do that work. So tell me if I've got this wrong. So somebody buys an investment property or they decide to move out of the home that they've been living in and make an investment property. Uh, their accountant normally, I would think, would suggest to them, look, you need to go and get a depreciation schedule because the, the depreciation will be tax deductible. Uh, they go and contact you or a company like yours and you go and inspect the property and then put together a schedule, which then they give back to their accountant and every year at the tax time they include whatever deductions they can. Um, and so like you say, they engage with you often by email, you may not even talk to them and you would only do one. You would only do that schedule once, right? 
Generally, yes. So the only time that we would revisit it, if it would be if they're undertaking major renovations. And if they're doing minor things, they might have all of the costs, so they don't need someone to estimate them, which is really our specialty. So yeah, most of the time it's a one-off transaction. There's certainly some repeat investors in the sample, but as you know, 72% or thereabouts, depending on the ATO tax sets, um, are only buying one property. So the majority of people yeah. within our survey will be individual properties owners. And so your data then is really capturing what decisions they've made at the point of purchasing a property. Yeah, so we know where they've bought, we know what type of property that they've bought, whether it's a unit, a house or a townhouse, we know whether they're buying new. And by virtue of questions that we need to ask or analysis that we need to do, we, we, would, we would know whether the property was built after 1987. That's a very important cutoff date for us. We would know the renovations that they're doing. We would know the floor areas. And of course, the data that we collect, which is the total construction cost, which is our estimated cost, and all of the the deductions as well. And when we're talking unit developments, we also collect the number of units within that development. And we found some pretty interesting stuff on that as well. Do you tell? (laughs) <laughs> so we found that development sizes rose pretty rapidly and they peaked in our data in early 2018, then contracted to be slightly above the average number of units of five years ago. So I, I don't know, do you guys want to have a stab in the dark if you're buying a strata titled investment property, how many units there would be in the development back in 2016? Okay, I'm going to stab in the dark and say 35 Chris? I'd go for 20. I've got 20, 35. Well, it was 61.53 in 2016. So it's pretty big, right? It was big. Yeah. yeah, If I had to guess, and this is, this is what, sort of really is intoxicating for me about the data is that it doesn't matter what you think it'll tell you right that's why I like marketing as mm, well you yeah know, you flip test things and you're like I think this will work and you know the market tells you what's working um <laughs> we, we we found that that peaked at 96.91 units within a development in 2018 which is that's a that's a big development right that's that's it's a, a big rise big, yeah, it's a huge rise. Now, this this one might tickle you. Um, the Opal Towers incident was December 2018 and the Mascot Towers incident was June 2019. So for anyone that can't remember what happened there, we had some pretty major issues with those uh, with those towers on the construction. Uh, Opal Towers was evacuated over Christmas, made a lot of media. Um, we found that our data dropped off fairly rapidly in 2019 it went from 96.9 to 83.3 so Mm. and after that 2020 it went down to 72.38 so it i can't i can't prove that the the sort of zeitgeist of the investor pivoted around the fear of these bigger developments but it's 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 interesting sort of anecdotal evidence i would say probably aligns with what the developers are moving towards is you know, the investor stock to building properties that soon owner occupies, which just a bigger and smaller number of apartments in developments, you know, maybe targeting, say, downsizes and things like that, rather than kind of lots of... That would have happened so quickly though, would it? Like, I mean, that the developer lead time is so much longer to have that actual reaction in such a short period of time would be really unusual. Well, yeah, I think that might not necessarily have made its way into the data, but certainly investor decisions because they're a bit quicker than the lead time of development. But you you have certainly got your finger on the pulse there to, to some degree, Chris, because the the prevalence of townhouses has become really, really popular. So um, if we look at 2019, we found that 13.6% of investors were buying a townhouse. And in 2016, that was 6.3%. So it actually saw the the biggest growth of property investment type of, of, say, houses, units and townhouses. Townhouses just soared ahead because it's it's it, it appeals a lot more to the downsizers. And I think a lot of people have gotten sick of the shoebox style apartments. Yes, they're always going to be popular with uh, with students, certainly foreign students. Obviously, there's some corona issues with that at the moment <laughs> and some massive downside risk. But I think 
baby boomers that are downsizing, they, they want quality, they want a reasonable size, they want an extra bedroom so they can have people sleep over. They, you know, they want to have a garage because they've bought, you know, a 1960s Jag with a in red, you know, to sort of tie in with their midlife crisis, all that sort of stuff. Are you talking about anyone in in particular there, Mike? It sounds quite vivid, this description. My car's grey, so I won't go any further than that. (laughs) Silver, silver. Um, In terms of um, you'd think, though, that with all these Opal Tower, you know, there's been lots of media around sort of new apartments, um, you know, Grenfell Tower, you know, in in the UK, you know, all the cladding issues, um, that's been in the papers for many years. You potentially had all low valuations, um, off the plan risks have kind of been a lot in the papers the last few years. Would you see though, you know, you think though, if you see all this uh, media around new apartments that you think that people are buying less new properties, but is that the case you're finding with your data? It is not the case. And um, I, I, I know you guys will probably be very, very upset to hear some of this data because you, 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 you've got a, a very strong agenda in looking after people and not making mistakes. And one of the best or easiest ways to make a mistake is to buy off the plan in a big development without doing, you know, your due diligence and all that sort of stuff. So mm. we actually found that um, outside of, uh, let's say, units versus houses, the percentage of people buying a new dwelling in 2019, which is our last data set, was 49.6%. And back in 16, 17, it was 23.9%. And if you, yeah. can, if you look at the people that are either building or buying a brand new property, so for example, if you're a property investor you can engage a builder to build an investment property so if you you add those together the percentage of people that are building and that are buying a new yep. dwelling is 71.5 percent so the Ooh. vast majority of people are going for spanking brand new now that's that's great from a depreciation point of view, you know, and, and this mm. is where it's a bit interesting with the data. People might sort of say, well, my data's, you know, advocating buying brand new. That's not the case. I'm only doing what people bring to me. Uh, and yep. there's no argument that depreciation on new properties is better. And people ask me all the time, what should I buy to get maximum depreciation? And it's the sort of investment that would make you guys terrified, right? And me as well, because it's going to have six levels of basement. It's going to have, well, you know, why stop at 90 apartments in the complex? Let's make it a thousand, right? Because you get a share Mm. of the 10 $6 $6 million lifts, you know, all that sort of stuff. That's what makes the depreciation great in these big high-rise complexes. I don't know what to say. <laughs> 70, over 70% of the investors that you've been, that have been coming to you um, buying brand new or getting something built. Yeah. And it's horrific. Um, it's absolutely horrific. Yeah, I'm a bit speechless. Do you, do you get lots of your clients through accountants? Um, yes. You know, because this is, I mean, part of the problem, this is not a shot at accountants. It's just, I guess, the ignorance of, or I'm not understanding the, you know, the ramifications of how different properties perform um, and the impacts of their, the clients that are take, buying these properties, their decisions. But, you know, how, what percentage of your customers come via accountants? Because a lot of investors don't even know depreciation reports exist, which is one of your problems that you're probably trying to solve. Mm. Um but, you know, if, if most of yours come from accountants, can we kind of bl- put a bit of blame there that accountants are potentially sending them down this rabbit hole where, um, you know, they're, they're basically buying you because of tax deductions? We, we could certainly try. Um, and you're right that I've been trying to educate investors on their entitlements for more than a decade. Um, a lot of the time you'll find that accountants will go and do their tax return with their client and they'll be surprised to hear that the client has purchased a new investment property, which is mm. which is never a good idea. If you're a property investor and you have an accountant, well, well if you don't get one, um, get a good one, um, you really should be saying, oh, look, Mr. or Mrs. Accountant, I'm looking at an investment property. What structure should I buy it in as an absolute minimum, right? Because that has mm. huge implications 
to the amount of tax that you pay and, and of course, um, the, the, the safety of that asset depending on whether you own a business and all that sort of stuff. So, look, I, I think it would be a bit unfair to, to have a go at accountants for that because I think a lot of them would actually just be trying to sort of tidy up the mess of what's been purchased. Certainly there are accountants and financial planners that are plugged into networks with developers that can, of course, get a commission if they're placing people into into certain yep. assets. I think it's always a good question to say, you know, you're recommending this property. How does that work? What are you getting paid? Blah, blah, blah. But I think it just it really just comes down to the education of the individual investor. And we kind of like, we, we've built this society where we like shiny new things, right? You know, you've only got to look at the cues for the new right. iPhone and all that sort of stuff. I think people are attracted by the marketing that goes together with these with these apartments and these new properties. We all like the new stuff. Yeah, it's very true. We actually did an episode some time back, and I'm trying to remember the number. Um, with um, what was her name, Chris? So, um, from the from a company that actually does the marketing, uh, Cat Burgess, and we we really talked about all all the the marketing around this uh, these new complexes, and it's true. I mean, it's it's that creating that FOMO, it's creating that um, the the dream, you know, selling the dream basically. And the reality is it's all very nice to sell a dream, but particularly if you're buying an investment, it's got to deliver. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so many of them don't, which is really, really horrible. But I want to bl- I think the, the state government's also a massive uh, to blame here, unfortunately, in every state. I mean, we've got a client just this week where they, you know, he admitted it, he's been, he's a podcast listener um, and uh, you know, he's bought it off the plan in Adelaide. It was kind of a one bed sort of two bath. And, you know, he openly admits that he fell for all the state government, you know, uh, things that it was throwing at him, you know, the first time owner grant, stamp, stamp duty exemptions, etc. So unfortunately, a lot of um, investors, the state government encourages all this because they, you know, they push people down the wrong sort of stream. But yeah. It's a I was about to say, it always astounds me why you'd actually build a one bedroom, two bathroom apartment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. they do exist, but why? <laughs> well, you just have guess sometimes. <laughs> through through the week, you go to one toilet and then you save one for Sunday best. <laughs> That's for de- I think it's for depreciation, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the, the bathroom areas are pretty good because as a cost per square metre, there's so much tile and waterproofing, it's it's good. But, I mean, you know, like you've you've heard me prattle on about the nerdy stuff already. I'm, I'm yeah, but... To, uh, um, I was just wondering whether the marketers actually, they really, it's such a big push that you get great depreciation as if you put two bathrooms in, it actually does increase it. Maybe. <laughs> that, that's a, it's an interesting conspiracy theory. I can't tell yeah. you that I've looked behind the curtain and can give you categorical evidence, although maybe if I have in my industry, I couldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think uh, you, you touched on a really interesting point there, Chris, because you, you, you look at construction and the government sort of said very, very recently Recently, that they're looking at giving people uh, fifty grand if they're if they're getting a, a brand new property. I think with with oh, yeah. the construction industry, they're they're a big employer, right? And and they're, the construction industry is very important for the economy. And of course, the affordable housing debate always comes up around election time. I don't know that the government is necessarily pushing people to new property, but by trying to stimulate the construction industry, that just kind of happens by proxy. Or do you think that there's that, that there is something more at play? I think they're pushing, um, particularly first home buyers and investors, towards new property. I mean, you look at policy. You look at the fact that they've got first home buyer grants that that uh, they get more money if they buy new than they do if they buy existing. Um, and the same with investors, you know, negative gearing mm. and the way that depreciation is is currently set up is, is heavily skewed to new. Um, and you know, even when you look at Labor who were planning to abolish negative gearing except for new, um, you know, I mean, so so I think policy is, is very much weighed up to encourage those two groups in particular to buy a brand new property and keep the economy going. And I'm, I'm personally conflicted. I like a good economy. I really do. Um, but I also realise that individual purchases are the foundation of our economy. And that's a bit unfair because they generally are the ones that yeah. lose money through the whole exercise. You've got individuals, you know, first home buyers, people who are buying their first investment property and are taking all the risk. They're putting in all the money that they've worked hard to save. Then they're going to a bank and borrowing 
you know, 80, 90, even potentially the whole amount. So they're going into a lot of debt um, to basically buy an asset to support a construction industry. But also what it does. supports our economy. You know, so we can't even go, oh, the bad, bad construction industry because we all benefit from this. Yeah. And then I think the cost of an apartment, if you break down what that cost, where that money goes, some of it goes to the construction company, but a lot of it goes in taxes to the government. You know, a lot (laughs) of it's um, a tax on the development, a tax on um, you've got stamp duty, land tax, you've got profits of the construction company. So there's all this, when you break it, uh, yeah, rates. At every uh, level of government. And then at the end of it all, you got stamp duty on top of it. (laughs) So they tax tax. It's a cunning ruse, isn't it? Oh, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, you, it, but it's an interesting point about how we're incentivised towards new, and here I am maybe even disagreeing with myself from, from earlier, but, <laughs> you know, when you when you consider the, the major depreciation changes, which I think we talked about on the podcast last time, so mm. on the 9th yep. of May 2017, they yanked away plant and equipment deductions for established property, so you basically have to buy new. Now, we, we found that the average deductions – were actually were, were quite uh, adversely impacted by that change. So the deductions dropped, you know, around about 60%. I don't have the exact data in front of me, which is a surprise, I know. But <laughs> the data that I do have is is that the depreciation deductions uh, over the last four years have, have gone up in total at 23.72% across that four years. Um, so we've actually found that even though the deductions are uh, less that there's less available than what there was people have adjusted and they've shifted towards new because there are more incentives there are better to that tax deductions by going new so it kind of it kind of perverts the investor's decision when the government offers an incentive for one type of property and not the other so they are very very interested in stimulating new housing supri- supply and as you said veronica there's a lot of tax out there so it, it, it works very well it's a shame isn't it because you know it, it, it's a bit like it's actually worse than making a decision based on yield. You know, this is making investment decisions based on tax, mm. which obviously impacts your yield. But the reality is that if you're going to buy a property, is what we bang on over and over and over again. So don't tune out, listeners, because you've heard it all before. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, property is big and lumpy and risky and you're borrowing a lot of money. And so, therefore, you really need to be focused on capital growth because if you want yield, there's other things you can invest in that are not as big and lumpy and, and risky and you don't have to borrow as much money for. And so it, it beggars belief, really, that, that people are still taking such enormous risks with blindfolds on really purely so they can get more tax deduction and and actually in reality so they can lose money because they have to spend a dollar to get back 47 cents at at most um mm. and so they get back their 47 cents and if they don't get capital growth they haven't made up the other 53 cents plus actual return on investment and they're not thinking about that mm. losing money is the new making money <laughs> but <laughs> I know, think a big part of it as well, potentially those, Mike, do you, it's just the ease of buying a new property is much easier than trying to battle it out at auction or go to the market um, and do your research and deal with agents and, you know, do a building and pest and mm, check the contract true. and miss out. Like all that work is, you know, exhausting versus walking into a display suite having a chat, getting given a free coffee, maybe free lunch, and then, you know, signing a contract. And that's, I think, a big part of it as well is that it's actually just an easier, simple way to tick the box. I've got an investment property rather than having to, you know, the risk of having to do all this research and figure out what's the right property. And so I think a lot of investors just take the easy option and just, she'll be right, mate. It's just, you know, how bad can it be? Um so I think that plays a lot into it as well. Do you see that, Mike? Yeah, I think so. And you've you've obviously got the the security of the of the warranty on buying a new home as well. So you're not <laughs> sort of necessarily uh, worried about are you, maintenance. Are you being facetious? <laughs> yeah, I thought I, I thought I'd throw something out there uh, just to see if I can get it to land. If but, we're listening. But, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, one thing that I, I've thought about a lot is like, let's say you you want to buy a new house to live in. You're, you're, you're at the mercy of what is available for sale at that time, right? Like if you do it yeah, six 100%. months later, the house that you would be living in 
uh, is is completely different. Like it's it's kind of a weird thing. Like it's this this limited stock, and it's never the same from one month to the next, and sometimes one one day to the next. It's a bit of a sort of a lottery. Uh, and of course, all the properties are different. Yes, there are some suburbs where everything was kind of built at the same time in a master plan. But if you're buying in the in the city, you know there's 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 such a there's such an array of different types, and you've got to make the decision on mm. on which is which is best. You got to look at the way that it's based. You look at the age, the style of construction. Individually, they all need their own inspections as to the quality of the termites or the building and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think new property takes some of that concern away, but we it's also the psychology of of the carrot versus the stick and i think a lot of people are more fearful of the stick than they are interested in the carrot i think we probably need to update the name of the carrot i don't know anyone that that actually really sort of covets carrots anymore but maybe I'm caramello talking, a while, a caramello bear or something yeah the stick <laughs> or the caramello bear because people go to their accountant still and they say Mr. Accountant, Mrs. Accountant, I, I want to buy an investment property. And they go, oh, that's that's good. Why do you want to do that? And the answer is I'm paying too much tax. Capital yeah. growth doesn't come into that conversation for these people. And, and it sounds very silly, but it definitely does happen. People are worried about paying too much tax more than they're excited about growing an asset that's going to help them retire or help their cash flow down the track. Yeah, it's that short-term thinking, isn't it? And property is a long-term game. And so when you're buying with a short-term problem to solve a short-term problem, oh, my God, what you're creating for yourself down the track. But what is some of the other stuff that you, surprising stuff that you have, have uncovered through this research? Yeah, look, I think the, the townhouses was the, the most interesting one for me is that people are moving away from the high rise and they're wanting slightly bigger properties. Um, we found that property investors are becoming a little bit savvier about their, their tax depreciation deductions, which is good. Like my last 10 years have been completely wasted. Well, the, the, the time that they're, they're taking to order a report, that's a, that's a really big one, right? Because if you wait too long to order a depreciation schedule, you can miss out on potential deductions. So you can back claim two financial years, but if you're buying a property and you're waiting more than two financial years, you will miss deductions. And we found that- Okay, but- here we go. Mm-hmm. Because you've got more people buying you, that's on the increase, then they are advised when they buy, obviously, that they know in advance that that is something that they need to do. Whereas if they're buying established pro- properties, they may not know that. So that could be that they're not necessarily making better decisions around that. They're actually just being, that's part of the marketing spiel. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that would definitely be at play. But again, a bit like the living in the property and that must be the mm-hmm. first homeowner grant, the average time from, from purchasing a, a, a property to ordering a report is 524 days. So, yeah. Um, yeah, even allowing for people to buy brand new and they get one straight away, I still think that a lot of people are holding off. And we mm. did find 6.7% of our investors had waited more than the two years and the average amount wow. of missed deductions was Twenty thousand dollars, so that could wow. be seven grand in your pocket. And if someone sort of says seven thousand dollars to me, in my head I've already spent it, right? Like that's and and we should think about it as as real money. Like there's a weird psychological effect where you know they people win the lotto and they blow it within a couple of months because it's kind of not real, or they gamble and they double the money and they go, oh well, I didn't come in with that, so it's not sort of real anyway. No, leave, <laughs> take it. If you're up, get out. What are you going to buy with that, Mike? That red jag or the red, <laughs> the red jag? Yeah, I need uh, my receding hairline is 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 kicking into full gear, um, and yeah, I think I think I'm going to probably peak a little bit earlier on my midlife midlife crisis. I'm looking forward no, to it. Don't buy a Harley. So, <laughs> no, no, I don't think that's my style. <laughs> that with a mo. I think it's, it's, no, it's no old man style. Let me tell you, <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Have you got any idea though? Um, of what percentage of investors have actually got a depreciation report? Because a lot of established investors, you know, just have no idea that they should have one. Like it's, you know, the cost of, you know, I think you do it for a fifty dollars each, don't you? Just joking. Um, <laughs> but you know, the cost of, you know, five six hundred bucks or whatever it is, right, um, or even less to potentially claim thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of deductions for however long you hold this property. Um, a lot of investors just don't know they should do that. Um, 
And a lot of um, new property, well, yeah, they might know that they need a depreciation schedule because that's the reason they bought it for these depreciation deductions. So do you have any idea what percentage of investors don't have a depreciation report? Um, yeah. Yeah, look, it, that's an interesting point. Like if people buy new, they, they're probably more likely to understand they need a depreciation schedule. But I remember one poor lady in our, uh, our study who bought an apartment off the plan and contacted us 16 years later for a depreciation schedule and it had oh. always been rented out. And the oh. amount of deductions that she lost, like it was it was a good news story for her because she 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 paid our fee and we got two years worth of back claim and we sort of suggested she chat to her accountant to see if she can get a private ruling to go back. But it was like $60,000 of lost deductions. And even in that sort of um, that 6% that I talked about before of people waiting too long, if you extrapolate that over the investor population, it's $2.9 billion worth of unclaimed deductions out there. I mean, that's a bit of sort of media clickbait that we ran with, but it, it's it's significant. To answer the question about the percentage of people that have a depreciation schedule, it's very, very difficult to tell that. So the best that we've got is the ATO tax stats, which come out every year, but they're delayed right because a lot of people wait quite a few years to do their tax so they're normally two or three years behind and we can see the number of investors that are claiming capital works or plant and equipment deductions and and certainly we've had I've seen other companies say well look the average amount of claim by the investors is x but we on average get X in our first year, so people are missing out by this much. But I think they're failing to consider that these are people that maybe had a depreciation schedule 10 years ago, and we're talking about, well, what's the residual value that they're claiming today? So we don't know the exact percentage of people that have a depreciation schedule for their investment property. And there's certainly some types of properties that are rented out that aren't worthwhile to have a depreciation schedule done on. Now, what would they be? Well, let's let's say I, I talked about 1987 as a key date before. So if the property was built prior to 1987, you've got no depreciation claim on the original structure. So then we're looking at improvements. So renovations, new bathroom, new kitchen, new roof, carport, whatever. So if a property was built in 1981 and it's never had anything done to it and it's rented out, there'll be zero depreciation in that. That's a little bit unusual because if you spend mm. a little bit of money in it, you can probably double your rent. Like who wants to be living in a house with a kitchen from 1981 or a bathroom? So it's not a huge chunk, but that also is another gap in us being able to tell the percentage of people that actually have a depreciation schedule compared to the investors at large. What else do you think or other, what other myths or fallacies do you think that your research sort of uncovers as being myths or fallacies? Well, I think the the lived in one, the number of units within a development, they were all very surprising. The percentage of people that buy new, they're probably the biggest takeaways. Um, we're, we're finding a lot of people are, are spending more on renovations to their properties than before. So I think mm. it's, 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 yeah. it's, 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 reasonable to extrapolate that people are holding a little bit longer than they did before and they're they're trying to sort of build equity themselves by renovating or, or getting a yield uplift by doing cosmetic renovations and that sort of stuff. So the rise in average reno spend has gone up 62.88% in our in our sample. So I, that, I found that's that interesting. interesting one. Yeah. And that's interesting too because obviously that, that's uh, in terms of depreciation, that's where people holding established stock will be get more depreciation, right, because of the yes. change to the ruling back in 2017. So... Is it does it correlate with that change and that accountants are suggesting that perhaps? Yeah, I mean, you, you couldn't look at the data and say, well, that is the obvious motivator. But it, again, it's one of those anecdotal, it, it's happened and it seems to match. So that's sort of good enough as at least a discussion point. What What's what's interesting as well is that the, the four-year change on renovation spend across the, across the major eastern seaboard states, so New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, the, the New South Welshmen have, have increased by 100%, Victoria 22%, and Queensland down negative 2%. So that kind of leads me to believe that there is a little bit more available equity for redraw to spend on the renos. And in mm -hmm. our last data set, 
um, the average renovation spend after purchase in New South Wales was 50 grand and in Victoria 24 and, and Queensland 22. So I know Victoria has had a, a reasonable run, certainly in, the, in, in Melbourne for, for house prices, but we're seeing a lot more people spending money or at least people spending a lot more money in New South Wales and Queensland basically is flat. Do you have a, a split on houses versus apartments? Because I would, uh, I'm just making a bit of an assumption here that a lot of people that have invested in Brisbane, in particular, or southeast Queensland, if they're from the southern states, uh, would have been buying brand new. In which case, they're not going to be renovating, are they? Yeah. So I can have a look at our last data set here. Just see what I've got hot off the press for you. Um, so the percentage of people living in properties in Queensland is actually only sixteen percent. The percentage of properties with post-purchase improvements is thirty-nine point three nine percent in Queensland. Mm. Um, the the renovations on houses versus units. I don't have that data in front of me, but that's something that I can crunch for you. I think last time I came on, I had uh, a little page on our website with some data that I shared last time. I'll revive that, which is just our mcgqs.com.au forward slash elephant in the room dot PHP. Oh, lovely. Uh, I don't even we'll think you need that PHP, but yeah, chuck that in the show notes and I will... Um, <laughs> I will, um, I'll crunch that for you um, and that'll be like a little show bag for any listeners. Oh, great. Do you want to pop the link for your this report we've been talking about in there as well? I will, yes. Oh, anyone, I anyone listening, thanks to Veronica and Chris, you can get a copy of our shiny PDF, which, uh, <laughs> which will help you nod off to sleep for a good couple of months. <laughs> it's great isolation so- reading. <laughs> so, Mike, you've said here about that uh, there's about roughly 50 grand of... Uh, renovation costs is the average yeah. um, that people are spending on their reno. In terms of, let's say you've bought a property and you bought it, say, five years ago, um, and you're, you know, especially in this current climate, you're potentially having problems with tenants, um, you know, vacancy. And so, you know, the best way to get a good tenant is to renovate it. Um, how does it actually work from a tax point of view? You know, if some of those repairs are for repairs, I'll, rather than some are actually improving the value of the asset, and how does that work with depreciation reports? Yeah, well, repairs and maintenance is one of those perennial topics that the tax office talk about, you know, being the the thing that they're going to be auditing investors for. And in their recent yep. sort of published sample size, they said there was a nine out of 10 failure rate on, on deductions not being claimed correctly. So repairs and maintenance is the key thing to get right. People love repairs and maintenance because it's an immediate deduction. So you can claim 100% of what you've spent um, as a deduction in the year that you incur that cost. But it's important to consider that that has to be a a repair to something that stays in place. So if you have, say, a hot water system and you you install a new widget inside it, like a solenoid, um, that would be a repair. The property's got to be income producing at the time, so you can't sort of be living in it, do the repair and then rent it out. But if you replace like for like, so the hot water system dies and you put a new one in, then that's not repairs. It can't be claimed as repairs and maintenance. It's a depreciable asset. So in a renovation, most of the work is is probably going to be depreciable assets rather than repairing things that stay in place. And with the depreciation changes in May 2017, the government said you can only claim plant and equipment items if you buy a brand new property or you install that item yourself. So the structural part, if we say a kitchen, it's the cupboards, it's the bench top, you can claim 2.5% of what you spend on that each year for 40 years and then you tease out the plant and equipment items. So again, in a kitchen, oven, cooktop, range hood, dishwasher, if you're installing them brand new, you can claim those plant and equipment deductions. So there is uh, that incentive to do that renovation yourself it's the only way that you can claim plant and equipment in an established property is by chucking in the new assets yourself and then you got the 300 dollars limit right that is the 300 dollars or less immediate deduction so you can actually claim a hundred percent of all assets that cost 300 dollars or less if they're not part of a set so if you've got a dining suite and the chairs are a hundred dollars each but the whole thing 600 dollars you can't do it but yeah you can write off anything that has a value under 301 dollars that's a, a plant and equipment item so if you put fans in ceiling fans in for instance or something like that it yes. might might you know, or blind, new blinds, per blind, yeah. right? 
it de- depends on the on the value of the blind. Um, blinds normally would would drop into the low value pool, so individually under a thousand dollars, which gives you an eighteen point seven five percent first year claim, and then thirty seven point five each year until it runs out. Um, well, you but, love your numbers. <laughs> you go. I can't. I can't help it. You know, I toss and turn at nights just seeing figures. It's like Rain Man without the actual intelligence. Um, <laughs> I've got. Um, I've got something that might actually warm your hearts a little bit because we've talked about all of this off the plan and the unit purchases and all the stuff that I that I know is going to have certainly you you guys tossing and turning at night. It's um the increase in purchase prices for houses versus units over this over our sample size. So we actually mm. found that the 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 price people are paying for houses went up twenty one point three three percent, and the price people were paying for units went up ten point three percent. So that mm. is just what people are spending. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the increase in in the value of the house, but it's pretty close, right? So it's saying that people that buy houses are making more money on their houses. Wow, that is interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know quite what to do with that. I mean, <laughs> it, but also house, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because um, there's. You know, when you're buying a property, particularly if you're buying established, um, and let's forget house and land packages and brand new for a minute, but you you are limited to being able to buy what assets are out there, what what is uh, available for purchase on the market, and then obviously you've got the rest of the market co- to contend with and to compete with. So it is rather interesting that that's been the case because I would imagine that investors haven't gone out suddenly and changed the type of house that they'd be looking at buying as an investment. It would be somewhat of a homogenous idea you know or are you able to tell that well what we can tell is the the floor area changes so in 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 our our four year trend we found that houses the floor area grew by 12.61% whereas units ah. was was practically flat so the houses have gotten a little bit bigger whereas units actually went down um, around about a quarter of a percent, so that could influence it, but that's not mm. that's not a huge change. Like it might be an extra sixteen, seventeen square meters. Not it's maybe that's one of those little um, study nooks or um, you know half a theatre room or something like that. <laughs> so I'm always thinking about strategies, Mike, and I think you highlighted a very good one there, where uh, existing property like uh, investors buying existing properties so established properties on the market not new properties um, sometimes they're better off buying properties that are unrenovated and then doing the renovation after for two reasons one they might be able to add value to the property and b they'll be able to claim the depreciation on those renovations rather than buying the fully renovated apartment um and, and not going through the hassle of the renovation but another strategy i'd like to get your thoughts on is um Let's say you're thinking about uh, building a dream house um, and you want to uh, basically, you know, reduce the cost of that dream house by claiming depreciation. How would you, you know, how could you basically, you know, buy a block of land, build your dream house, you know, what's the kind of optimal time to kind of rent it out, claim at most, you know, the vast chunk of the depreciation benefits and then you move into it, say, you know, three to five, six years later, what... You know, is there a strategy there, you think? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I wrote an article on how to renovate your property a little while ago. And I wasn't talking about, you know, how to pull up the tiles and all that sort of stuff. It's just kind of like what not to do from a tax perspective. And one example of that is don't put tiles in it, put carpet in it because tiles is 2.5% depreciation rate, whereas carpet has a an eight-year effective life. So it's 200 divided by eight gives you the, the depreciation rate. So it's much better for tiles. But if, if you decide that you do want to move into this investment property, it's better to do it later rather than sooner. Because if let's say you're buying a, a brand new property, most of the plant and equipment deductions will be gone by six or seven years. Years. So that would be the yep. optimum time to move in. And it used to be the case that it was a great strategy to buy an overcapitalized property from a depreciation point of view because the market value kind of didn't really reflect what was done, right? Because people just look at it and they say, well, it's over 
fires that doesn't meet the area. The owner spent a yep. fortune, but you're the beneficiary of that when you buy that. But that's kind of changed now because, yes, you're mm. the beneficiary of the structural work. So that might be the, the gyp rock, uh, it might be the roof, the concreting, the cupboards and joinery and that sort of stuff. But all the plant and equipment items, you can't you can't claim them unless you've you've purchased them brand new or, or you put them in yeah. yourself. So my my advice when you're when in how to renovate the property is don't be living in it while you're renovating it. It's much better to to renovate between say a, a tenancy because if you if you renovate a property and you occupy it for some time, you can kill off all those plant and equipment deductions. And when the uh, the prime minister who was then the treasurer said, look if you're if you're buying. Um, a brand new property, you can claim those plant and equipment items. So, you know, nothing's changed. What what definitely has changed is if you bought after the 9th of May 2017 brand new and then you decide to live in the property, at the point that you start living in it, you will kill all those plant and equipment deductions. So if you are going to do that, I would get the tax benefit first. Now, not everyone yeah. sort of makes their lifestyle decisions based on the best tax treatment, right? So if you have a family <laughs> emergency, you're not going to sort of go, no, we can't move into that house. We're staying in the tent because we're not going to get the cooktop and the <laughs> oven deductions. <laughs> But all things being equal, you, you you probably need to have a strategy and think about the best way to do it if you've got those options. It is very true. But the thing that um, the sort of the sting in the tail of getting depreciation or claiming depreciation is when you go to sell it though, right? Mm, I knew this. Was- to- well, I guess if it's your home, then I guess that's the – so I guess there's a strategy there where you potentially – you buy an older house, you live in it for a period, um, so it's growing for you tax-free, and then you've got six years, and then you knock it down and build your dream house on it, um, and then you basically just rent it out for six years and you claim all the depreciation on the build. Yeah, but then um, your home is no longer tax-free when you sell it. Well, you've got to use the six-year rule on that property. How does that work, Mike? Yeah, look, uh, I'm not going to jump into the into the the CGT as, aspects of of claiming your own a residence, but of course, um, your own residence will be CGT exempt. But the moment that you start claiming depreciation deductions, then you're going to have that CGT issue. And and on that point that that you raise in paying it back, I think uh, often this is the question that I sort of get heckled at a a presentation. So if I'm asked to present for a property group or something like that, there's always sort of someone at the end that sort of says, oh, why would you do it? Because you've got to pay it back. Well, it's only really the the structural part that you need to worry about. So let's say Mm. you buy a property that was built in the 90s for, this is just going to be easy for my maths, um, $100,000, you sell it for $200,000, you've made a $100,000 capital gain. If you claim $20,000 worth of Division 43 deductions, so structural deductions over that point, then you've made a $120,000 capital gain. But if you have the property for more than a year, you've got the 50% exemption, so you're only worried about half of that tax, and then it's at your marginal rate, so it's more than half again. So we, we, we sort of model that, and we can't see a reason why someone would avoid depreciation because of the CGT implications because it gets cut in half and more than cut in half again. And it depends on the time horizon as well. Like a dollar today is worth uh, a lot more to you than it will be in 20, 30 or 40 years. You never and know in this all- environment, but it's, it's still probably, <laughs> yeah. still probably going to be okay. yeah. um- well, true. Uh, the thing is also that you've got the cash flow, you know, from an investor's point of view, you've got that cash flow uh, boost while you're, you know, in the early years of owning that property. But there's also, I just think that that's one of the things that if you, if someone is looking at a strategy to try to maximise their deductions, if they're going to um, renovate their own home, as, you know, in the scenario that Chris put forward, they also have to uh, understand that that's it, you don't just draw a line in the sand and say, well, that's it. You then when you sell your home down the track, we'll have to actually pay a bit of tax. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I always recommend an accountant. So we, we collect accountants details when we're doing a report because often we, we want to have a chat to them because we can some we can sometimes change the, our, our approach 
to, to the benefit of the client. It's a little bit harder with the depreciation changes that have, have come in with the plant and equipment, but, but we could sort of massage it based on what the goals of the investor was. So if they were only going to hold the property for three or four years, then the deductions that we're getting in year 35 mean absolutely nothing to them. So we we when we come across property investors that you know use e-tax or or do their own thing we we definitely encourage them to have an accountant and not all accountants are created equal as you know uh so it's important to get one that is specialist with the with the property stuff and ask them the question here's what i'm thinking of here's what i'm afraid of the big bad tax man what can we do how can we structure it to get the best possible benefit i mean building building a team around you as a as a property investor i think just in general in life is 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 a worthwhile experience just from your own learning and because you're going to avoid making the mistakes that experts will be able to spot for miles away Preaching to the converted here. I think yeah, it takes a village. It takes a village to buy a house or buy an apartment. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Mike, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. Oh, look, I always feel like mean-spirited with these dumbos because last time I think I might have even picked on that woman that waited 16 years to get a depreciation schedule. And I, I think... <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to make it the, the person that doesn't consult with an accountant in, or an advisor in their purchasing decisions and just does something like buying brand new or buying off the plan. I think really for all the excitement of, of the shiny brochure or the bl- brand new splash, splashbacks, this could be something that you're stuck with for a long time or forced to sell at a loss and the opportunity value that you're missing out could be huge. So let's make them the Dumbo. Oh, I want I a specific example. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. You want me to just point at, you know, Scott Morrison, he's the dumbo. Oh, you can do You're that. Right, yeah, and I think the solicitor is a big part of that decision as well. Like I think, um, you know, a lot of people don't really understand that it's an unconditional contract, um, mm. that there's no way that they can potentially, they can just walk away with just a 10% deposit. A lot of them believe yeah. that. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, the understanding of contracts is a big part of it as well and, um, you can't just walk away. Um, it's just going to hurt a lot of people at the moment, especially who have lost their jobs, who, you know, potentially can't settle on apartments, you yeah. know, or, uh, and then they, they think, oh, well, I can just walk away from the contract. Well, no, technically you can't. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, you just got to you've got to value the experts, the 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 people that that value our time and and expertise. You can just sort of tell that that's their approach. They know what they know, and they are pretty educated on what they don't know, and they value the expertise of others. And that, and in most cases, that value is worth paying for. Mm. Yes, it's uh, but it is interesting because with Australians, we all are property experts, aren't we? And most of us can't keep our opinions to ourselves, and uh, we all think we should be able to know how to do this. And that's one of the. I, I love it when I go out to a dinner party, and of course, people who don't know me will ask, you know, what do you do? And I tell them what I do, and oh my god, the amount of advice I get from people <laughs> <laughs> it just astounds me. Anyway, bit of fun. Um, one of the benefits of COVID, I guess. <laughs> yes. not, not exactly not going to dinner parties thank you so much mike for coming and joining us uh we look forward to putting those links in the show notes as well for listeners who want to get into some of that uh data who enjoy being a bit of a data nerd as do you and we do uh, appreciate you bringing that nerdity is that a word along mm-hmm. and sharing with us <laughs> Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, it was a real labour of labour of love for us. We really enjoy that. And yeah, if, if anyone's interested, they can get a copy of that report and we'll we'll build a community and perhaps I'll be sort of a, a, a data cult leader. Who knows? <laughs> the grand poo bar, <laughs> the fizz of the poo bar or whatever they call you. There you go. <laughs> we just need to loosen up these restrictions. Thank you, Mike. Cheers, Chris. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... Well, we talked about the importance of what I call a village um, to help you buy a property. And uh, Mike certainly discussed at length uh, the importance of actually having the right advisors on your team. And 
how to get those right advisors is a challenge though because you do need to ask them the right questions. I mean, if you get your accountant on board and you say, oh, how do I save money on tax? Well, that's not really the right question. So really this boot camp is around thinking about what are the questions you should be asking um, and so that is really taking yourself away from what is their area of expertise and saying, well, I want to long-term achieve X and how am I going to get there? How can what you do and what your area of expertise is that will get me there? What would you say about that, Chris? I do think it's in, it's uh, about the quality versus the quantity. It's no point just saying you've got a broker or a financial planner or a buyer's agent. Um you know, there's good, bad and ugly in every industry. And, um, you know, really, if you want the best results, you've got to get the top quality advisors in those areas at the problem, like you say, that you want to solve, you know, there's no point going to, I, you know, for example, there's no point going to a financial advisor that specializes in retirees. If you're 30, you know, there's no point going to a, a buyer's agent that buys investment properties. If you want to buy a home in Sydney, let's say. Um, so I think it's all about, yeah, getting the best professional, um, and it takes time and, and part of that due diligence would be asking good questions and figuring out if they're the best um, and doing the hard yards. I'd much rather see five or six professionals to figure out which is the right one than kind of wishful thinking, picking one professional and then five years later saying, oh, actually that wasn't a great call. So I, what I find is that, you know, I, we certainly see it in our business where people will come to us and say, right, well, I want to buy an investment property and this is the sort of property I want to buy. And I'm like, okay, can we just park that for a minute? I don't want to ignore what you said, but I want to understand what you want to achieve because that might not be the type of property that will actually help you achieve that. For instance, and I'll give you an example. A lot of people come to me saying, I want to buy a house because the value is in the house, in the land, sorry. Um, And so therefore that's going to be the best investment. But I really want to talk about, well, a, how much money have you got to invest? Because that's going to decide whether you determine whether you can afford an A grade quality yeah, house true. versus an A grade apartment. Um, B, how long do you expect to own that property? C, are you a renovator? How much, how hands on do you want to be in the actual uh, management of that property, et cetera, et cetera? There's a whole bunch of questions. Um, you know, what's your cash flow? How do you have the ability to withstand the fact you're going to get a lesser rent on a house? There's so many more questions that really need yeah, to be true. blown out of that because then if if I can understand tease those things out with the future in mind, which is what property has to be, then we're going to get a better outcome. And that client may not necessarily buy what they thought they were going to buy when they came to us. But that's the benefit of getting an expert that actually says, hang on a minute, you got a tax problem. That's actually a good thing to have, you know, if you're an accountant, rather than fix the tax problem and then create a whole another problem, let's look at where do we want to go in life? What decisions do we want to make to go in that right direction? And so, and certainly the same with a mortgage broker. It's like asking a mortgage broker, I want I want the broker that gets me the best rates. It's failing to understand how the real where the real value lies in the advice that a specialist and an expert in their field can give you. So I guess this boot camp is really around not going to that expert and telling them what you want, but going to yeah. the expert and saying this is our long term plan. What are the pitfalls? What are the what what would you do if I gave you a clean sheet of paper? What how can you advise me? in this area and make sure they're only advising you specifically to their area of expertise. So when an accountant says you should buy brand new so that you can save tax, that's ex- advising you outside of their area of expertise because they're advising you on the type of property to buy. Yeah, 100%. I think it's going, if you want to be, do you want to go to an advisor then just to get validation um, about what you're doing is the right thing? When you walk in the door, they completely agree with you. They tell you what you're doing um, is the best thing for you. And then they just facilitate what your you bad want, decision whether that's tax advice <laughs> whether that's buying a property whether that's a mortgage whether that's financial advice you know whatever insurance etc so i mean i guess it really comes down do you really want to go to see an advisor that will actually advise you and give you what is actually best practice and the optimal thing for you and your future and sometimes it might be difficult to hear and completely different to what you're thinking or do you actually just want to go and get validated and just be proven that what you were thinking was right and unfortunately i think a lot of people do want the latter and actually just want validation. They don't actually want to hear the best advice. Please join us for our next episode. We interview futurist Craig Rispin. 
Now, the future is an interesting place, particularly in the face of lockdowns and COVID and all the rest of it. So this is interesting discussion, though, because this isn't really just about, well, how are things going to look differently now that we've had this shutdown period? It's actually talking about the future that is already here, the future that is here that we don't even know about that could and will impact on property prices, where we live, what we live in, who we live with. You really need to listen to this one. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.